Okay, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much for the nice words. Uh, I really look forward to come here and talk about the new revolution in the DNA sequ sequencing te technologies and so on. I've actually changed the title a little bit to more about how can we use the secret lives also in what engineering in, in different uh, aspects. Um, you may probably remember around 10 years ago, the human genome was sequenced. And uh, a lot of stuff has come out of that. Uh, we have learned a lot about uh, our disease, the genes. We have talked about uh, evolution and that's all things. And that was really fantastic at that time. You may also remember about the, the other genome, the microbes. Because uh, over maybe five years ago, it was uh, the first reports about our uh, uh, micro, microbial genome was, uh, was uh, presented. And we learned a lot about interaction between bacteria and, and, and our cell. Remember, we have 10 times more bacteria than cells in our body, so to speak. So they are certainly important for whatever we are doing. And uh, this was really a huge undertaking. It took uh, 10 years to make the first genome. It took 200 people 10 years for a cost of $3 billion. Think about it, that was a lot of money. Uh, and how come uh, that we now talk about revolution? That's because I can go to my lab today, I can put in a sample, I have a human genome completely sequenced in just a few days to a cost of a few thousand dollars. So that's quite amazing, I would say. Um, that's due to the sequencing revolution. <coughs> um, as you see here, uh, that's the price for, for uh, a human genome, uh, around 100 million uh, in 2001. That was, they learned something during the, the first 10 years. And then uh, the, the, the price for sequencing has decreased according to Moore's law. As you know, it's a, the computer power is doubled every second year, and that means the price is, is dropped to the half. And that, until 2007, 8, Illumina, a special company, they came up with some new technologies. And you just see it really dropped the prices. So that means now you can go and sequence anything very fast to almost no money. And we believe that in just a few years, you can make your own genome in a day or so, and it costs maybe one, $1,000. So that, uh, makes completely new uh, possibilities for, for anything. Um, people have now started to sequence anything. You know, have heard about plants, animals, and so on. And of course, we go to the engineered systems. We can now do a lot uh, on those systems to learn about the microbes. Uh, we can start asking questions we couldn't ask before. What sort of microbes are present? Uh, what are they doing? What sort of uh, what controls the present and activity and, and that sort of things. So, uh, for instance, in wastewater treatment, drinking water treatment, and so on, people are now starting or have been working on this the last few years. But if you, if you were a little bit into molecular biology, let's say, three or four years ago, you are hopeless outdated today. I mean, it has really changed a lot, and we have new methods uh, that can different things today. Um, so what I'm going to do is to talk a little bit about uh, how do we identify those bacteria, give some examples on how we can use that. Uh, I'll talk about uh, how can we in investigate what they do uh, in uh, those bacteria, and uh, I'll uh, give you some take-home messages in, in the very end. So, we can now identify all bacteria in any sample, reliably, fast and cheap. And uh, I'm often asked why I care. Why do you care about a long list of names? And it's actually quite easy to, to, to answer this. Uh, first of all, we need a link to any bacterium to its function. Uh, what does it do? <coughs> Think, uh, if you get an infection, would you be satisfied by just knowing it's a bacterium? I would love to know it's a salmonella or E. coli or whatever because if you got treated, you should know what it is. The same goes for any other system. 
Another thing is, when you find a certain bacterium, it's nice to know whether it's the same in China, in Lisbon, in Denmark, because if you have knowledge about the function, you can apply that anywhere. So, yes, we need name and link it to function. So, how do we do that? Well, all bacteria, they have a chromosome or DNA or genome, as, as we have. And uh, typically, uh, one bacterium has uh, four or five thousand genes, and those genes determine whatever the bacteria can do, as genes do in humans. And just as a small question, a bacterium has 5,000 genes. Do you know how many a human? How many do we have? How many genes do we have? Did I hear something around 20,000? So, in terms of genes, we are only five times more complex than a bacterium, just so you know. <coughs> um, one of those genes that's uh, this is called 16S RNA, and it's a strange name. I'm not uh, explaining why it has a name. But this one is uh, the one we are using for the ID. Uh, and that's because it exists in all sort of bacteria, and it, uh, it's, it's slightly different. The composition of this gene is slightly different in different bacteria due to mutations or, uh, and evolution. So this gene is what we use for the identification. So what we do, we simply sequence those genes. And the way we do it is by using what we call next generation sequencing. Uh, and the workflow is here that you take a sample and you extract the DNA from the sample. You get then the mixed DNA from all bacteria in the, in the system. And uh, you amplify, that means you make a lot of copies of this particular gene. And that's called the, the PCR products. And uh, then you can sequence this and you get what we call a, an amplicon library. That's simply uh, all the, when, when you get sequenced, you get all the, the bases in the DNA, and then you go into a, a database using bioinformatics and get a long list of names. So you get a list of names, but also the quantity. So you, it's quantitative as well. And that might be up to maybe 50,000 bacteria in just one sample. So a list and quantitation, very fast, very cheap. I can do it from day to day. It costs one to two hundred uh, dollars for one sample. Um, so having this tool in hand, you can go and sequence wherever to get the identity of any bacterium. And uh, we are working quite a bit in, uh, in, in wastewater treatment, but also in many other systems. And uh, we have always been interested in, in, in knowing what sort of bacteria are actually present in, in, in wastewater treatment plants. Is it so that, uh, do we have a lot of them or few? And is it so that it's very different from one plant to another one? Uh, and we did a survey in, in many different Danish plants. And here you can see that's a, uh, it's a summary of, of uh, the bacterial species we found. And surprisingly, we found that in all those, in this case, uh, 30 plants, we had more or less the same abundant bacteria. That means we had bacteria that were uh, in high abundance, so in, in reality we, we, we just have to look at maybe 100 bacteria. Just 100, maybe 150 species make up the vast majority of biomass in all Danish wastewater treatment plants. That was surprising. Of course, in each plant you have several thousands, but they are just present in tiny amount and not really important. And that means we have here a system, let's say the the, the, the the wastewater treatment plants, and that's, you, you can already now start learning the, the word microbiome. Uh, I mean, a microbiome, that's the mic microbes in a defined system. We could have it in humans. We could also have it in wastewater treatment plants. So this is a human, or the, the wastewater treatment plants microbiome. And that can be started in a great deal, because when we only have maybe 100 species, it's possible to, to, to study those in great detail. Remember, those bacteria cannot be isolated. So we've got to do it using those uh, molecular methods. So uh, we want to know identity, but also link function to, to those. And one way we have uh, applied quite a bit is using single cell techniques. And uh, that's, for instance, to make marker, markers that can label specific uh, bacteria, so we can visualize them in, in the microscope. Those nice red ones are specific species. Uh, and then you can combine this with uh, other methods that can inform you about physiology, uh, how they grow, 
uh, what they eat and, 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 and other things. So in this way you can actually get a lot of information about what they do in, in, uh, among those on, uh, 100. And we have said, wow, in a microbiome uh, it's very similar. We made similar experiments in China, in uh, Australia, in US and in uh, other parts of the world. We get more or less the same, maybe not 150 but maybe 200. So we can make what we call a field guide to the microbes of agrotoxins. I guess you have all heard about field guides of birds in Australia and, and so on. So why not a field guide of bacteria in, in aqueous lots? So that's a resource for anyone who wants to learn more about uh, bacteria in aqueous lots. And uh, it gives you information about the taxonomy, what's the names of those. It gives you uh, <coughs> information about the function, uh, the distribution, and uh, also the morphology, how do they look like. Um, so uh, you can also go and search for specific species, exactly what, what is known about those species. You can go and look for protocols to make the DNA extraction, to make the sequencing, so you apply the same method as, as, as we do to make it unified. So uh, this is actually, uh, uh, I think, very useful. It's, uh, it has been running now for half a year in reality. And it will be extended with a lot of collaborators worldwide in the future, so we get a very extensive study of this. So having this in, in hand, we can start looking at, at other things. Now know something about the bacteria, some of uh, the function of at least at a certain level. So we are interested in such thing as stability of the plants. And uh, since we now can sequence fast and cheap, we can make time series of all things. So uh, uh, here you see a list of bacteria in, in, uh, in, uh, in one plant, here is uh, the list of bacteria, and it's maybe 1,000 species. It's just the top 15. And you see the green shows the abundance over years, from 2009 to 2011. And uh, we're really dealing with big data here. Remember, maybe several thousand uh, measurements in each point. So how to get a, an idea whether this is constant or not, how it changes. Then we use statistics and cluster analysis and try to, to uh, uh, convert the one time point for one point in such a, 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 a plot. And then those that cluster together, they are very similar. So that's a way to make a fingerprint of the entire community and see where they vary or are similar or not. So uh, we have investigated a lot of treatment plants over many years, more than 500 samples. And uh, I'll show you one example here uh, of some of those plants. So here you see how each uh, plant has a specific microbial population, and you see that they cluster together over time. So it's not so that one plant changes population a lot and, and becomes like another one. It's really pretty stable over the years. That was quite surprising for us. So we have now a common core of bacteria, where most in all those plants we do also have very high stability. So that means, again, it's, it's nice to, uh, to uh, study those and, and, and uh, uh, run them. So, so, so what can that be used for? for um, ah, uh, the slide here is showing that well, although you think they are very similar, if you here are three, uh, you can also, if you go and look at the specific uh, years, you can actually see that some plants make some changes. Some plants are the same over, over the years. So that's a difference. So how can you use this to also to, 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 to handle operational problems? That could be done uh, by, by those time series. I will give you an example. Here, there was a treatment plant they one of the biggest in Denmark, a huge plant, and they experienced once in a while very bad uh, performance, and the slots uh, did not perform well. Those, uh, that's the bacteria, and they grow in those small flocks and they fall apart, and that was very annoying for, for everyone in this plant, but they didn't really know why. They had a, a suspicion that there was a, an oil refinery that had some load to the system. By, just by chance we had a lot of samples from this particular plant in the freezer, so we took them up and then we sequenced. And you can see, again, with this uh, uh, plot, you can see it moves from before it went back uh, bad to a new situation when it was bad, and then recently it has, been, it has changed again and actually went good. And that 
fit very well with the oil industry so, uh, and the load. And we could also go and see for specific bacteria that made it very likely that this industry actually uh, caused the, 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 the bad performance. So one example that by sequencing the entire community in time series, you can go and, and help for troubleshooting and come up with ideas about uh, uh, it can be handled. Um, so those sequencing uh, technology, those uh, um, uh, cheap time series and so on can really be used for plant. Now I say wastewater treatment plants, but it could be any system in the water engineering. In this case, we can say, what about plant? Is it prone to instability? We can say something about whether, uh, when we can expect stable information. We can go for indicator species, uh, early warning systems. Uh, we can go for bioaugmentation. That means adding bacteria with specific function into the system. We can follow whether they survive or not. Uh, we can look for specific pathogens and how they behave and bacteria that uh, degrade uh, micropollutants. So a lot of things. Also uh, using the experiments for similar plants because using this statistic you can see which plant is similar to yours. And that means you can learn from this particular one. Uh, and uh, you should really think, or we should think, Google, we should think all this information we get of this should go into some sort of public resource so anyone can, can use it and apply it in China, in Australia, when they have similar problems. <clears throat> of course, it's not that easy. There are still some problems with the data generation, handling, and interpretation. That's something we are working hard on, and, uh, and it will definitely be solved in, in, the, in the near uh, future. Um, all this was based on wastewater treatment plant. But it could be any system. It could be soil bioremediation. It could be resource recovery, as Willi Verstade will talk about uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, so those methods can be used anywhere. And for instance, in, in the water distribution system, it's obvious to use that sort of time series. And it's, right now, we're often using a specific method that just goes for certain genes or certain bacteria. We can just take all of it. Bacteria, viruses, and then nothing. Um, <clears throat> and that could be any place in the distribution system. Um, so what we need to do is to define those, let's say, similar ecosystems, what we also call a microbiome. They are so similar that you have more or less the same bacteria in those. And then ensure this expertise is available, that knows something about the system, and something about the sequencing methods. And then, of course, find joint resources and funding. And then we should also consider really to establish those biobanks with loads of samples in the freezer you can take up and, sample, uh, and sequence. When, when. And then simply to do it, we can do it in all the engineered system in the water system. And we should do it, we can do it in a few years. Um, that was a little bit about the identity, a little bit of the function, but we can do a lot more in relation to what do the bacteria do. And uh, then we are coming into a bit more heavy uh, DNA uh, stuff, but let's try. What do they do? Uh, that's also what we could call systems, uh, community systems, microbiology, and uh, I'll give you some examples. Um, DNA is a blueprint for whatever any bacterium can do, or any organism. So uh, going into the, the organism, you will end and see the, the DNA, as I briefly mentioned before. We have the genes, and they code for all the proteins, and the proteins will then it's the machinery of the bacteria and make sure the bacteria do whatever it should do. So if we know the genome, we can go and look in the genes and we can predict what can this bacteria do. Uh, and sometimes there are some unknown genes we don't know about, but overall we can predict pretty precisely what a certain bacteria can do. Let me give you uh, an example. Nitrospire. That's a bacterium that uh, carry out nitrification. And nitrification is very important to convert ammonia to nitrate in all water systems, drinking water systems, in soil, in, in uh, wastewater treatment plants, and so on. And this is the key organism, this nitrospire. And many of you know it probably. So it was sequenced by Holger Daim's group in Vienna a few years ago. And by digging into the genomes, of course, it was possible to see that they can denitrify. Oh, sorry, 95, uh, as I've written there. But several surprises were there. For instance, 
they were sensitive to high oxygen levels. It was possible to see some, some genes coding for enzymes that are very sensitive to, to oxygen. That means today people think about if the nitrification doesn't work, turn on the oxygen, more oxygen. But that's exactly what you should not do. You should make, maybe reduce it because they don't like high, high oxygen. Uh, another thing that could, we could see is that they can actually consume organics. Usually you consider nitrifiers as some bacteria that can fix CO2 and grow in that way. It's not true. They can also grow on organics. That can explain many observations where things did not fit to what we, what we thought. Um, and another surprise was actually that they are not nitrifiers. They can grow on hydrogen. So uh, actually we published uh, this paper in Science just three weeks ago showing that uh, this nitrifier can grow on hydrogen. And that means the perception we have today that the presence of those bacteria is the same as nitrification takes place is not true anymore. It, it can do a lot of other things. So that was an example of how we can go into the genome and get a lot of, a lot of uh, useful information about the bacteria. That can also be used specific to treat problems. And in this case, uh, I will give you an example with foaming and bulking. I think many of you have been at a treatment plant and uh, if you ask the operators, they do not like this, all this foaming. It's really annoying. Uh, and uh, it's quite common. And if you dig down a little bit, you see it's often due to filamentous bacteria. And uh, by making the molecular tools figure out what they are, we can see it's a species called Mycotrix. And it turns out to be a worldwide problem. A lot of foam form Mycotrix uh, over the entire globe. And uh, it has been very hard to control it. Um, we have done a lot of studies and we have also got the genome and by making what we call a metabolic reconstruction, we can go and see exactly what they do. We can get information about the, the physiology. And what we could see is that they do only eat lipids, nothing else. And that's very rare for a bacterium just to eat one single substrate. So to control it, we can either remove the lipids, that's usually not easy, or we can add some specific chemicals that prevent the bacteria from taking up the, the, the lipids. And it works very well. Uh, when this is implemented uh, worldwide, this method, uh, it works very well. And it is based on a genome knowledge, but also a lot of, let's say, in situ experiments. Um, so this is just uh, examples uh, uh, on two genomes. In reality, we would like to have, let's say, in the act activated loss systems, we would like to have all 150 all the key ones because they're important. But in drinking water there would be another 150 and anywhere there would be a number we would really like to have a genome. How do we get it? Well, usually you would take a sample from that particular place, you would put it on an agar plate, you would grow the bacteria and then you would extract DNA, sequence and you have a genome. And uh, the problem is that many bacteria do not really like to grow on an agar plate and you may uh, of course, you want to have the really important one in the system. You want to have the strong guy who is really important in the system, but you may end up getting something else. And this little nice dog really doesn't tell too much about uh, the bad guy who is the dominant one in, in, in the system. So uh, it's hard to get. So, uh, so if you get some, it, it's often the wrong one. And in reality, it's almost impossible. We know today there are between 1 million or 10 million different species and we have only isolated maybe 10,000 and we have only genomes of 5,000. So there's a long way to go. But uh, there's a solution called metagenomics. That is not just to look at the genome of one bacterium but to look at entire community. So uh, as you can see here uh, there might be pieces of uh, genes from maybe thousand uh, bacteria and uh, that's, that cover all this. So instead of looking at one bacteria, we can look at all the genes for the entire community and get very good ideas about what this community does. Usually we like to get the genomes of the individual bacteria and not the entire system. So there are some new methods coming on where it's possible to, from this genome to extract, uh, sorry, this is the wrong one, to extract the genome uh, so we can 
I can get the, spe the species-specific genomes, and that's really what we want uh, for, for many purposes. This is still only for, let's say, specialists, very few groups can do it, but in the near future, a lot more will be able to, to do this. So, uh, that means in any system, we can get the genomes of the key players. It has not been possible, it's just a year ago it has been possible. But we can do it now, we can get it. A lot of them, we can get them fast. Just one example, we have now most of the important ones from the activated slot system, uh, and uh, a lot more are on the way in this system and, and in our systems. Um, when we have those in hand, we can use it to what we call community systems microbiology. That means we try to integrate the knowledge about all the, the different bacteria by, by, let's say, the novel methods. And that's, let's say, the future. That is what can we do with our system. Um, again, we can extract DNA, get the metagenomics. We can also look at genes, what sort of genes are expressed. We can see what sort of proteins, enzymes are expressed. We can see what sort of metabolites are turning around or shuttling around in the system by sequencing of di in different ways. All this can also be done in, let's say, day scale. Uh, and you can integrate the data and get a lot of knowledge about individual bacteria, interaction, and the entire community. This is, works nicely in, let's say, <coughs> simple system, in rich reactors, not the very complex. But that will come in just a few years. And that can be used <coughs> for any ecosystem manipulation when you know about the system. So uh, that's where we are heading, and that has really, will have huge, uh, 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 of huge importance for the entire uh, system. So uh, I think I will, yeah, I will just uh, summarize that. Of course, when we get those new data from the genome, from the system of microbiology, we add it into this database, and that's what should be done to any database. Because what I really like to say is that now you can, you have to think big. You should not think about one sample anymore. You think about hundreds or thousands of samples. And it can be done in a very short time. We can identify very fast and reliably. Function is coming. It's coming, but uh, it, uh, it will not take that long time. It's important to define those similar engineered systems, wastewater treatment plant, digesters, soil, drinking water. Uh, microbiomes. So we have to learn that word, the microbiome. Um, and we should really join, uh, join uh, resources to, to establish those things. And uh, we should establish biobanks in each system with loads of samples we can use for all of us for experience. And uh, just do it as I mentioned before. And if you think this is, is, uh, sounds exciting, <coughs> uh, what I hope, then there's a chance to learn more about it, to hear more about it later today, because we have uh, our BioTrust activities, that is activities between IRA and the ISMI, that's the, the International Society for Microbial Ecology, who are making all those fancy methods. So we have a method there, and we, have, we will give some awards, so uh, that will be a very uh, interesting session. And we have also some other uh, workshops this afternoon on the same topic. So join us if you like to hear more. I'd like to thank the people in my lab that have made most of the results you have seen today. And uh, I think I will stop here. Thank you. <coughs>